guys and welcome back to our YouTube channel. If you are new here, we have a ton of videos all about fitness to help you out. So definitely go check them out. But my name is Sue Bush and this is my husband, Alex Bush. We are co-owners of a company called Physique Development and that's exactly what we do. We develop physiques, we train, we educate and we empower. And today we wanna be able to get you some answers to your questions. So we looked at the top 20 fitness questions and we're gonna answer them for you here That's today. Right. Let's go ahead and start off, Alex. How much should I lift? This is such a broad question, how much you should lift. I think that there's multiple ways that we can take this question. The first thing is going to be maybe the intensity of how much weight you should pick up and those different factors. And so one thing that we teach our clients is going to be staying above an RPE of seven. And maybe now your next question is, what in the world is RPE? And RPE is going to be rate of perceived exertion. So that's going to be in relation to how close you are to failure in that exercise. You're going to take that into relation of how many repetitions you feel you're away from that failure. And so it's going to be that number minus 10, and that's going to give you that RPE of seven that I'm speaking to. And so pretty close to failure within your working sets is going to be important. You don't need to take every set to failure, but getting close within those working sets is going to elicit the best hypertrophy benefit as well as just maximizing your overall training experience. Question number two, should I avoid eating fat to lose fat? This is a great question. The short answer is going to be no, but I think we need to back up a little bit and figure out what fat does. There is a large difference between dietary fat and then the fat on your physique. So when we look at dietary fat and what it does for us, first it's gonna help with an absorbing nutrient. So you need fat in place to be able to absorb vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, and K. It also is going to produce hormones and dietary fat is going to be monumentally important for your hormones to be running in the right way. And you need things running internally correctly so that you can lose fat. It's also going to protect tissue within your brain. And then it is going to help within reducing inflammation. So we wanna be able to look at what types of fat that we want to eat. So we want to make sure that we're having monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats. We're having omega-3 fatty acids are gonna be so important. And we wanna make sure Sure we stay away from things like trans fats and being able to limit the amount of omega-6 fatty acids we have in place. That was an incredible answer. I don't have anything to add. All right, then let's go on to question number three. And are squats bad for my knees? They can be. In, in terms of your lack of execution or performing the movement incorrectly, these certainly could put strain on your knees. But in terms of really executing the movement properly, having it set up for your body type and your limb lengths and those different factors, it should not be a greater strain on your knees. And you're going to have to do a squat um, throughout your day of maybe picking up your kid or picking up the groceries or those different factors. And so it's gonna have a great carryover to just your day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I love that. And that was what I was gonna mention is that it's a very functional move. And also when we look at squats, you don't have to think that you have to do barbell back squats. Squats for you, depending on where you're at or if you have arthritis or you have an issue with your knee, it might be wall squats, it might be box squats, it might be some sort of modification and that's completely okay. But stronger muscles are going to help with stronger joints. That is going to help within strengthening the different tendons and being able to help within any kind of pain you might be feeling when it comes to your knee. Number four, how much protein should I eat in a day? Great question. I would say the RDA, which is going to be the recommended daily amount, is gonna be 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. Now, if you're watching this in America, we normally do not measure our body weight in kilograms. So if you do wanna know that conversion, about one pound is 2.2 kilograms. So just something to keep in mind. That is going to be a great amount if you're a non-exercising adult. If you are an exercising adult, that's gonna be a little little bit higher number there. So what we wanna be looking for within this metric is we wanna make sure that we have 1.6 to 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. But we can even see benefits from being able to have all the way up to five grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. If you are a healthy adult, if you already do have kidney or liver issues, then that might come into play. 
I'll give you a little bit more of maybe a, a practical use outside of the research. And what I would encourage you to do is to track your protein just in a normal day, eat as you normally would. Maybe that protein will be as low as 60 or 80 grams throughout a day. And you get those equations in place and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to eat 180 grams of protein every day. That's more than double my protein. What I would advise at that point is just to add 10 grams, maybe 20 grams of protein to each meal to start to get closer and closer to what that recommendation is so that you can build up to that point. Because if you just jump from taking in 60 grams of protein to 180 grams the next day, you're gonna have a little bit of GI distress and maybe uh, some you know, poor bowel movements and those different factors. So we want to avoid that and slowly progress our way up to that higher intake. Yeah, and you can easily burn yourself out if you yeah. go from zero to 100 real quick. And then if these equations are confusing to you, an easy one to go by is going to be one gram per one pound of body weight. So that's gonna be an easy thing that you can go ahead and use to move on over. Next question here, question five, how many calories should I eat? This is a good question as well, and I think that having a more practical approach is going to be the most uh, beneficial for everyone watching. And so when we look at total calories, again, tracking where you're at currently is going to be extremely beneficial. And I think that finding that area in terms of where you're eating from a week to week standpoint, track for an entire week, take that average and see where that number falls. I think you may be surprised in how low or maybe how high it is. And so let's say that you're wanting to lose body fat and you take that seven day intake and it's 1100, 1200 calories, very low. It's gonna be in your best interest to elevate calories, maybe adding 200 every 14 to 21 days till you get to a point that's roughly in the ballpark of maybe the 2000 calorie marker, for example, and getting yourself into a better maintenance calories rather than being at such a low intake. And so when we look at it maybe from a higher intake, we can take a very similar approach and maybe subtract 200 calories, track that for 14 to 21 days and be able to uh, continue to decrease over time, depending on what our goal is and how you uh, address those calories, but there are going to be uh, equations that are, are useful as well. Yeah, and when it comes to those equations, they are gonna be incredible. In fact, we have our own equation, a physique development macro calculator, and we'll also have the podcast going over some more information when it comes to if you're using that macro calculator. But with those calculations, again, they can be so great, but if you don't know where your baseline is or where you're starting, then those aren't extremely helpful because because that might spit out, hey, you should be intaking about 2,000 calories, but maybe like Alex said, you're intaking 1,100. And so jumping up to that 2,000, you might be like, my body's not having the response I wanna see here. So really being able to see where that baseline is and then what that goal is that you have and being able to move in the direction that you need to from there. The next question is, how much rest should I take between my working sets? You know, these are some great questions. They are more broad, but it makes sense why they are gonna be a little bit more generalized when it comes to the popular questions here. So I am gonna give a semi-generalized answer and then we'll see if we wanna go a little bit more in depth. But again, it's gonna depend, but on your goal here. So if you are going for strength and really trying to increase strength, that rest period in between your sets is gonna be two to five minutes. If you're going for muscle size and hypertrophy, that's gonna be 60 to 90, maybe 120 seconds when it comes to hypertrophy. And if you're going for endurance, it's gonna be 30 seconds or less. Again, those are generalizations. It's not going to be across the board. If you only want muscle size, you should only do this rest period. They don't have to live completely separate or you don't have to choose one and only do that for the rest of your life. They can exist in different aspects aspects, but I did want to be able to give you some rough time frames that you can think about when it comes to rest periods. I'd like to add that there's been a little bit more recent research pertaining to hypertrophy training that is going to be best from a rest period perspective to be between two and three minutes. And I think that giving these guidelines are helpful, but truly coming back to the intensity component of things and paying very close attention to how much effort you're putting into each set is going to be very important. And then being able to uh, find yourself in a situation where you're ready to give that same effort in the following set is going to be important. And so that's going to vary depending on where your effort lies. And I think that paying attention to that rather than sticking to these maybe a little bit broader guidelines is gonna be best for you as you're continuing to chase your physique improvements. Next question, 
Should I be taking that crazy steroid creatine? <laughs> well, first you should know it's not a steroid. It's actually one of the most researched supplements and it is absolutely incredible to have in place if you are regularly exercising. So the lowdown on creatine here. So our body creates adrenosine triphosphate, ATP. And when we're using energy throughout the day, we lose a phosphate and it becomes ADP, adrenosine diphosphate. Phosphate. And so within creatine, this works off of saturation, but it actually says, hey, take a phosphate from me and turns it back into ATP. So it allows you to have less muscle soreness. It allows you to have more output when it comes to training and all in all can just be so beneficial for your body and for your physique and your energy standpoint. The research is gonna show that you only need five grams per day and it is going to work off of saturation like I mentioned, so you wanna take Take it every day, even if it is a rest day. Now, the best time within research is to take it post-workout, but within our clients, we're more worried about consistency. And it's not something that you're going to notice a difference from right away. Like when you drink caffeine, you notice your energy coming up. But when you're taking creatine, it's not like I take my creatine today and then tomorrow I add 20 pounds to my PR type situation. It's gonna be something that if you are consistent, you're able to see results potentially improve over a year's time, two years time. You're gonna see small incremental improvements by being consistent with it. Creatine would be the one that I would suggest first to someone to add outside of a health supplement because it is very cost effective and there is so much benefit and so much research when it comes down to that crazy steroid. The next question here kind of goes in relation. So are BCAAs any good? Any good is uh, <laughs> is an interesting way to, to put it. So with BCAAs, this is something that has been in the supplement industry for a very long time and it has been marketed towards everyone as something you should take during your workout to make sure that you stay anabolic. And the reality is, is that we're not able to just stay anabolic 24 seven. They can be useful. They can serve as an energy source for the liver to be be able to function off of and that's going to be a very minute piece but is it going to be something that you should force into your budget from a supplementation standpoint every single month I don't believe so. There's going to be a much greater emphasis on getting your total protein each day. So branched chain amino acids, just essential amino acids are going to be the building blocks to those full proteins. So if you're able to get your protein in on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't think that supplementing with BCAA powder is going to be necessary for you. Yeah, I think we always like to break it down to what would we suggest our clients or ourselves? We had this budget, how would we decide what goes where? And when it comes to something like BCAAs or EAAs, we often and found that we're leaving it out. Not that they don't have a place, but just not going to be on the priority list as high as something like creatine. Next question is, should I do my cardio fasted or not fasted? Another great question. These are all such great questions. <laughs> my answer might surprise you, literally however it fits into your schedule. There's not gonna be a large discernible difference when it comes to how much more fat you're truly burning when we look at it from a daily perspective. The biggest thing when it comes to cardio and what we always talk about with our clients and with ourselves is how can you be consistent with it if it does need to be part of your day. So I actually do do fasted cardio every day and it's not too to lose fat faster or to burn more fat. It's literally just the best time that it does fit into my day and I like doing it at that time. So fasted versus fed is really gonna depend on how it fits into your day. The only asterisk I'll go ahead and put there are there are some different fat burning supplements that are going to only work when you are in the fasted state. So that is when there is gonna be more of a benefit. As a whole, it's gonna depend on your schedule. I'll speak from a, a preference standpoint. When I am going to resistance train, I really wanna just focus on my resistance training as a whole. I don't wanna to have to do uh, a very hard training session and then have to do cardio after if I can avoid it. And so I prefer to do fasted cardio. One, I'm gonna be extra, extra hungry, right? It's just like not fun. Um, so I prefer if we can split it, let's split it. Question 10, we're flying through these. Do DOMS hurt? You guys have maybe heard this. DOMS stands for delayed onset muscular soreness and so it is exactly as I just said, it is a delayed onset of the muscular soreness from the training session, not just the day after, but maybe two days after and so on. And so uh, in terms of does it hurt, 
I would say it's just as uncomfortable as any other soreness, but you do want to avoid having excessive DOMS and, and being in the position where, let's say that I'm training legs on a Monday and the next time I'm training legs is on Thursday. If I'm still sore by that session on Thursday, I probably need to back off the volume a little bit on that Monday session or increase my food, increase my quality of sleep. Those different factors that are going to positively impact my recovery are going to be really important. Yeah, and so within DOMS, this can be that it is tender to the touch, you feel some swelling, some inflammation, some stiffness. Normally you see DOMS come up if you are pushing the intensity further than you have in the past, you're doing a new type of training, or it's in a place where you are training and overexerting yourself. Next question, and this is the one that I know you guys are the most curious on. How long does it take to see results? Depends on how consistent you are. And I would do a wink right there if I could, but I don't know how to wink. But truthfully, when it comes to seeing results, you can see results in as little as one week. We've seen it before with our clients. But on average, I would say that you're gonna start seeing results around four to six weeks or around eight to 12 weeks. But it truly does depend on how consistent you are, where your starting point is, how much effort you're putting forth, as well as where you are hormonally and what different aspects are going in on that side. Normally for my clients that I see that with, it's when they're coming to me and they are doing excessive amount of volume and we bring down that volume so their inflammation in their body just sees a really quick change or they are in a place that they're having a lot of digestive discomfort and so within a week's time we can see some really quality change. If you are a new trainee or an advanced trainee or you've trained for a really long time, that's also going to determine how fast you see results. I'll add in terms of seeing results, it's gonna come down a lot to your expectations as well. And so putting yourself in a situation where you're working with a coach who has the experience to be able to guide you and understand what's really feasible in the time allotment that I'm giving myself. Because I know that when I first started, my expectation was to look like Jay Cutler at the end of the year, and I was maybe 140 pounds. Jay Cutler is a former Mr. Olympia who was well over 300 pounds of just <laughs> solid muscle tissue. Was a giant. You were really human. close. I got it excessively close, and you guys can see that on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number 12. Should I lift heavy to build muscle? You should, and we talked a little bit about this early in terms of the RPE needing to be higher than a seven, and this is going to lend to lifting heavier, to challenging yourself, to putting yourself in a situation where you may be a little scared to lift the weight that's there. The main thing when we're doing that is maintaining overall execution, keeping yourself in a safe position, but lifting heavy is going to be a very important piece of putting on serious muscle tissue. All right, next question. Will light weights make me toned? Great question. <laughs> Your muscularity and your level of leanness are going to determine how toned you are. It's not going to be whether you lift light weights or heavy weights. It's going to depend on what your level of muscularity is and then how lean you are. But I would say more often than not, to get to that toned look, you often need to see your scale weight go up to gain that muscle before you can get that more toned look. I will add, in terms of looking toned, it's going to be about having water and glycogen being stored in the muscle belly. And so if you are in a very restrictive diet and, and being like, oh my gosh, I don't have the same pop or lines to my muscle bellies. One, it could be that you don't have enough muscle to really showcase. That's a very high possibility. But it also could be that you're not fueling your, your body as a whole with carbohydrates, with fluids to be able to have that definition that you're seeking. All right, so question number 14, should I have a cheat day? I don't know, should you? It's one of those things that is your lifestyle or the way that you're going about your dietary intake putting you in a position where you cannot just follow it for a seven full days? Like, do you find yourself in a situation because it's so restrictive that you can't even fathom just to continue on for an entire week? I think that that's something you have to ask yourself. And so you probably need to find something that's easier to adhere to over the long haul, needing to have these cheat days. I think that it, it associates a negative connotation with good and bad foods and, and creates a very negative relationship with food in general. And so 
I prefer, especially within our clients, to not call it cheat day, to not call it a cheat meal, and really focus on how are we fueling our body? How do we feel? How do the foods that we're intaking make us feel? And we really like to make that focus on that social aspect of going out. So while some of our clients might have what you perceive to be a cheat day once a week, it's really that they have an untracked meal or untracked day once a week, and they might end up eating very similar meals, but then they might go out and have something where they just don't have to pull up their phone to track it. And that leads me into the next question of what is the best diet for me? <laughs> well, all diets work but not all diets are gonna work for you. Let's go ahead and take an example like being paleo, where that might be a great diet for you specifically. Maybe you have a health issue and using a paleo or a Mediterranean diet is the best benefit for you, and I know that that's the case for some of my clients. But within that, something like a paleo diet might be extremely restrictive for someone else and not fit into their lifestyle or what's available to them, and so, putting yourself in a place where you have to label how you eat or you feel like, oh, the paleo diet is best, I have to do this, or the Mediterranean diet is best, I have to do this, or the keto diet is best, I have to do this. All diets can work. You can see fat loss, muscle gain with every single diet, but it is largely gonna depend on if you can stick to it to see those results and how it fits into your life personally. Yeah, I think that we just focus very heavily on the overall education of nutrition so that our clients can navigate past their time working with us and be able to navigate through their nutrition with an understanding of what they're consuming, why they're consuming it and those different factors rather than focusing on this specific diet or that specific diet um, so they're able to see success long-term. Number 16, are nuts yeah. healthy? No, no, I'm just <laughs> This is another aspect of verbiage that I don't love in terms of, is this food healthy? Is this food unhealthy? It's always going to come down to the quantity in which you're consuming. And so if we were to sit and just inhale nuts all day and you'd be like, oh, these are so healthy, it doesn't matter. Like, I think that many people, when they say this food is healthy, it immediately means that there's zero calories and as long as I just continue to consume them, I'm going to be healthy as well as I'm going to achieve all the fat loss goals and body composition goals that I've ever had. And that's just not true. Can nuts be healthy for you or be able to enhance maybe some deficiencies that you have or include macronutrients that are going to be beneficial to your overall health? Yes, but the foods themselves are not going to be magic and just consuming them makes you healthy or makes you unhealthy. While they do have a lot of benefits of there's great nutrients and unsaturated fats, and as I talked about, fats are great for you and nuts are a great way to get dietary fats in, let's go ahead and take a nut like the Brazil nut where it has selenium in it, which is incredible for your thyroid, but that doesn't mean you should eat Brazil nuts all day. It just means that you need to be aware of what role they play when we are consuming food as a whole. So I have been consuming fitness content for years. I get this opportunity to potentially start. I get nervous, like where, where should I start with my fitness journey? What I would recommend for you starting, if this is brand new to you, is find your baseline. Just start tracking some metrics. Let's go ahead and take steps for an example. If you have not tracked any metric, you have not looked at what your fitness goals are, just being able to say, I'm gonna move as normal this week and see what my step count is. And then from there, you can see, oh my gosh, I only get 3,000 steps a day. I now need to get 10,000 because that's the healthy metric. No, you need to start climbing up that ladder. So maybe you get 3,000 a day, now it's working on getting to 4,000 thousand and then I would look at your food so instead of thinking I need to figure out macros I need to get on a diet and I need to nail down everything the first step is just tracking your food intake so maybe you are only having 60 grams of protein like you mentioned earlier or maybe you are having hundred grams of fat in a day you want to look at those numbers look at how much fiber you're having in a day and really being able to start taking those building blocks same thing with water let's go ahead and see how much water I'm intaking instead of getting so confused and so overwhelmed on where to start, start where you're at. And that's going to be just tracking metrics so you know what direction or what route to take from there, as well as you have that baseline to build off of. I would say 
Be willing to suck. As an adult, it's very difficult to get into new things. So be willing to not be good at something, be willing to fall on your face, and you're, like, you're not going to track it perfectly. Going on to number 18 here. Should I work out if I'm under stress? I have a, a personal opinion, and then it kind of gets into the coach as well. And so for me, when I first started training, it was all because of, of stress and, and being shy and those different factors. It was something that gave me a lot of confidence. So I was going into the gym to release a lot of stress, to release a lot of frustration, anger, what have you. And so that was kind of my route of getting into training. And so I would be remiss to sit here and be like, no, if you're stressed, you don't wanna add more stress to your body by resistance training because that's how I got started and that's how I fell in love with it. And, and it served as something so positive in my life. And so if you are under tremendous stress, your body is very fatigued, you're not able to sleep, you're, you have a lot of things going on, it may not be best that you continue to add more stress and resistance train. But let's say that you are maybe going through a breakup or a divorce. You're in a situation where you've got to really just let go of some of this burden and stress that you're under. Go train. Yeah. It's a good idea. I think we always want to be able to look at trainability and recoverability. I 100% agree with Alex and I am someone who loves training and it has been a stress outlet for me, but it is a stressor on the body and we do need to think about the outside stressors that life is going to put on us and what our recoverability is to determine, hey, should I go ahead and train right now or am I kind of at my stress threshold without training and I need to focus on recovering? Obesity and lifting. Is it safe? Yes, it actually is very safe and very encouraged. That doesn't mean that you now need to go under a squat bar or go pick up the heaviest load that you can. Go ahead and ask your doctor what they recommend if you feel like you're at risk, but start small. Maybe you don't start with lifting right away. Maybe you start with something like a recumbent bike and just being able to take that off of your knees and get your body moving and start focusing on nutrition and just moving your body a little bit. Don't have anything to add, that was good. On to question 20. Will weightlifting make women bulky? The age old question. I, I think that uh, if any of you women find a way to get bulky as fast as humanly possible, I'm talking one training session, lift weights, and you're immediately bulky, LMK. Hey, I give me a call, know. please. Yeah, I would love to know what's gonna get me jacked and bulky very quickly. To answer the question, no. It's going to be something that's going to actually provide the tone that maybe some of you are, are wanting to achieve and giving you some of that muscular definition, some of that muscular density um, that gives you the, the curves and shape to your physique that you're desiring. And so I think that lifting weights is going to be extremely important for men and women to do. Yes, and I am going to go ahead and have linked below a podcast that we did on this exact topic, but I am gonna go ahead and read off some benefits when it comes to strength training, self-efficacy and confidence and being able to really notice your capabilities as a woman. And I have very much so experienced that when it comes to lifting. So I'll also link a podcast that we did with one of our coaches talking about the struggles that women go through when it comes to building muscle, because we feel you there. But strength training is going to improve your overall health. It's going to lower risk of disease like cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, memory and concentration concentration, positively impacting the development of Alzheimer's, and so much more. So strength training is going to be a benefit. Man, woman, child, whoever you are, it is going to have a very positive benefit on you. And getting bulky is not anything that I have ever come across with the thousands and thousands of clients, mostly women that we have worked with. We have not made anyone bulky. No. <laughs> All right, so that was all 20 questions. If you have a common fitness question or just a fitness question that you want us to answer that wasn't part of these 20, then go ahead and comment them down below and we'd love to be able to get you an answer. But thank you guys so much for joining us and we hope that we got your question answered and we'll catch you in the next one. Thanks guys.